Thank you very much. Good morning, church. I trust that you have come prepared, in spite of whatever your circumstances are, good or bad, to worship our good God this morning. So would you stand with us and let's sing to the King with all we've got. King is in the room. Come see the scars of love upon his head. The king is in the room. We'll watch the darkness flee at his command. Who is this king? Who is this King? His name is Jesus. His name is Jesus. The light of the world. There's freedom in His name. Awesome in power. Reigning forever. Light of the world. There's freedom in His name the healer because the healer's in the room let miracles break out across this place the Savior's in the room no soul beyond the boundaries of his grace and there's resurrection power His name is Jesus, light of the world. There's freedom in His name. He's awesome in power, reigning forever. Light of the world. There's freedom in His name. There's freedom in His name. Oh. There's never been a love so great He died so we could live Then he rose up from that grave Name another king like this Now all authority Forever belongs to him He reigns in victory Name another king like Sing it along There's never been a love so great he died so we could live, and he rose up from that grave. Name another king like this, now all authority. It forever belongs to him, he reigns in victory. Name another king like this, and name another king like this. Rose up from that grave. 
reigns in victory Name another king like this There's never been a king like this oh, There's never been a king like this Oh, His name is Jesus The Bible talks about us as the fact that we are sheep. The Bible says we are his people, the sheep of his pasture. The most famous psalm that we know begins with, the Lord is my shepherd, indicating that we are his sheep. The prophet said that we all like sheep have gone astray. I think those of us that are in tune with reality in our own lives, know that we are a lot like the sheep. Wait for it. <laughs> See, we need a shepherd to pull us out of the crevice again and again and again. Our God is faithful. He pulls us out of the crevice again and again and again. So let's sing to him and thank him for his faithfulness.
chosen to join us today. Um, I think today is such a gift that we have been given. I know we lost an hour, so that might not feel like a gift, but that loss of hour brought us all together. So we have our 815 crew and our 11 o'clock crew together today. So if you see someone that you don't know, please tell them hi before the end of the day. Get to know someone else who is a member of our church family this morning. Um, if you are a guest with us today, whether this be the first time you have ever been here with us or you've been visiting for a while and we haven't had a chance to reach out to you, we would love to have that chance to do that. If you will text FLGUEST to 833-571-3475, this just gives our church staff a chance to say hi. Um, that's truly all we want to do is say hi and thank you for being here. Maybe you're in this room and you have been thinking about becoming a member of our church or you have questions about what it looks like to be a follower of Jesus um, or any other question for us. Um, if you will text FL Respond to 833-571-3475, someone on our church staff would love to reach out and have that conversation with you. Um, as you might notice, we do have a few less um, friends here with us today. One of the reasons is our college ministry ministry is on their way right now to New Orleans. They are on a bus and they will be on that bus for a long time. So just start praying now, I feel like is a good note. And we'll just pray for them through the end of the week um, as they do mission work in New Orleans. We know that we also have some people out for spring break. Um, they might be actually tuning in online, but because of that, there will be no midweek this week. Um, enjoy that time with your family and friends. The psalmist says in Psalm 139, for I, um, he does, um, <laughs> he says in Psalm 139, um, for you created my inmost being, you knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Um, I hope that each of you know that and embrace that this morning as we sit in a room, um, all having been being created by the creator of the universe and that you know that you were made for something. I've been wrestling with purpose. What was I created for? I'm I've been wrestling with purpose. What was I created for? I'm more than what you see on the surface. See beneath my skin and scars. I'm skinned 
and scarred marred and twisted scarred by the past I need to be lifted and sometimes I question my own existence what was I put here for in my seams it seems that there seems to be more it's like I'm a light unplugged from the socket I mean do I really exist to put money in my pocket this nine to five feels like a nine to nine my mind entwined, I pass the time, life circles me as I wait. What is my estate? I feel like I was made for something great, and yet I can't quite put my finger on it. But when I look at my fingers and I see their design, I realize I'm one of a kind. And something created me. No, someone created me. And that someone made me for a reason. Even though it's clear the past years have been treason, I still sense this drawing, this calling, that even in the midst of my falling, there was someone who died to pick me up, someone who rose to fix me up, someone who's coming back to lift me up. And that someone is Jesus. See, God made me for a purpose. And when I delight in him, it's brought to the surface. Jesus, with his personal sacrifice on a cruel criminal's cross, showed his extreme love for you and me. The writer of Hebrews says this, he, Jesus, bypassed the sacrifices consisting of goat and calf blood, instead using his own blood as the price to set us free once and for all. He finished the work of redemption on that cross once and for all. The writer goes on to say, he, Jesus doesn't do this every year as the high priest did under the old plan with blood that was not their own. If that had been the case, he would have had to sacrifice himself repeatedly through the course of history. But instead, he, Jesus Christ, Lord of heaven and earth, sacrificed himself once and for all, summing up all the other sacrifices in this sacrifice of himself, the final solution of sin. So on the cross, when Jesus cried out, with a loud voice, it is finished. It was finished. All your sin and all my sin, all the sins of all the world, they were paid for. It was and still is finished.
Would you stand with us as we continue to sing? Strongholds bowing to the Savior, resurrection power over every circumstance. His word stands final and forever. It will not be shaken. He alone has won it all. Come on. Strongholds bowing to the Savior.
chains are gone, I've been set free, my God, my Savior, is ransom me. Chains are gone, I've been set free, my God, my Savior, ransom me, and like a flood, His mercy shall soon dissolve like snow the sun forbear to shine but my God who called me below will be forever Amen. Thank you, guys. Let me join Aaron in welcoming you. If you're our guest today, whether in person or online, uh, I just want to thank you for joining with us in our worship experience. And we would, as uh, Aaron said, we would love to follow up with you uh, and uh, have a conversation with you about what it is maybe to be a follower of Christ, uh, maybe to be a part of, of his church and to be a part of a local community. And, uh, and if this is all new to you, uh, then I understand fully that there's a lot lot to navigate, a lot to be understood. And so we just want to pray with you and help you to understand that, that process and what it looks like to be a follower of Jesus and the importance of being part of a, of a church family, uh, being part of a body, a community of uh, believers and a uh, vital part of the faith experience and cannot really be rightly pursued and lived out apart uh, from that church family experience. I want us to open our Bibles for a brief devotional thought. Uh, and I'll touch on it here in just a moment to Genesis chapter 2 in verse 18, the observance uh, in which we participate uh, this morning is one that has been described a variety of ways throughout uh, the history and the tradition of the church. Uh, Eastern Orthodox tradition of the church refers to this as, as the mystical supper, the uh, uh, Russian Orthodox Church refers to this as, as the secret supper. Uh, it's referred to as a variety of, of ways. The Last Supper in the Protestant tradition is a way that we have often heard this observance described, the Last Supper, uh, the Lord's Supper. And I'll tell you, as a new believer, as a, a 21-year-old college student who didn't grow up in, in a church and in, uh, in the traditions of the church, uh, those descriptions always threw me off as a new believer. Like, what does that mean, the Last Supper? You know, is this uh, the last one I'm ever going to eat if I participate in this? this or, you know, the Lord's Supper, is this the meal that he actually ate? And so it just, it's one of those descriptions that, that raised uh, a great many questions for me. Uh, my preferred, and the one you probably hear me say the most often, is, is the term uh, communion. Now, I think that's a very descriptive 
turn. And by the way, none of the terms that I have described for you over 2,000 years of church history and the tradition of the church and uh, the history of the church, none of these are, are found in Scripture. I'm always amused when someone says, well, I don't like it when he calls it communion. You know, it's a, it, you know, we need to call it what it says in the Bible, the Lord's Supper. Well, I got bad news for you. That's not in the Bible either. Uh, now, there is certainly biblical precedence for what we call things, uh, but that term specifically is found nowhere in Scripture. Neither is communion. Uh, but the word communion that, that is used is, is a word uh, that, that means participation. Communio in the, in the Latin is a word that literally means participation. Participating in something together. Something that is shared, something that, that is held in common. And so I've always, I've always been drawn to that particular term and, and always appreciated that term and, and the importance of, of what it is to be gathered together as a people of God. Because it was the intent of God that we be a people who commune. That we as his people, we're a people of community. That we are a people that engage together, that participate together, that, that live in association with one another, that, that hold things in common together. When you look at the creation account in, in Genesis and the creation account, the purpose is, is to hold forth the agency of God in, in creation. Uh, the ancient Near Eastern writers, when they were writing from a faith proposition, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, they didn't pretend to answer all of our Western questions. We are often, oftentimes at fault whenever we come to the ancient Near Eastern text trying to impose our Western questions upon that text. And, uh, but the ancient Near Eastern writer had no such interest, uh, nor would the ancient Near Eastern writer, neither would they have ever anticipated our kind of Western questions that we impose upon the text. The intent of the creation account is to hold forth that God is the agent of creation. Doesn't pretend to answer the question of when did this happen? Or how did he do this? What it does address is the who and the why. But in that account of creation, what we should note and what I'm calling our attention to this morning is that when we look at the creation account, everything that God did and acting as the agent in creation, everything that God created, we know that, that at the end of that, after every creation act, he said what? It's good. Created the mountains, the streams, the forests. It's good. The sun and the moon, it's good. Everything that, that we see here as, as being a part of the, agents, the agency of God's creation, the declaration is made that it is good. And yet despite all the things that God described as, as being good, he said, it is not in the design of my purposes that man be alone. And so the first thing that the eye of God beheld as not being good was man by himself. It is not good to be alone. And so in the Garden of Eden, Eden meaning idyllic, perfect, so when God created this idyllic condition called the, the Garden of Eden, which holds forth what, what the purposes of God look like, what, what God wants life to look like, when, when this is God's design, he says in the most idyllic, idyllic setting, in the most perfect setting that captures what life is supposed to be, The declaration of God is that it's not good for man to be alone. 
That's why I find myself so often drawn to the metaphor of, of family in, in Scripture whenever it talks about us as, as a community of faith, as, as the people of God. I think it's a metaphor that we do well to grab hold of and, and to never let go. That in whatever seasons of life, the good, the bad, I, I cling to this metaphor of, of a family, of shared association with, with people of like, like experiences and like and shared beliefs. A people that are living in less than an, than in an idyllic world, a world that is broken and we contribute to that, to that brokenness. Because this metaphor of family, it, it connects us to one another. But it also demands something of us. When you're a part of a family, you're, you're not allowed to be in, in isolation. You have, to, you have to participate. There's responsibility that goes with, with being a part of a family. That's why I'm, I'm oftentimes stumped. When, when there seems to be in this day and time, and it's not just this day and time, I mean, even the author of Hebrews, this is something that, that the leaders of the church have dealt with for 2,000 years, those that wanted to forsake the gathering of themselves together. And even as that ancient writer of Hebrews had to deal with that, those that were not connecting with, with the local community, I'm always taken back by those who profess to be followers of Christ, but they still have questions about, now why is it important to be, to be a member of, of a church? To be a member of a particular congregation, why is it important that I, that I connect and identify with a particular congregation? Well, you know, the, the idea of what we're seeing today where people say, well, I, I go to this church for, I go to this church for, uh, for, I like the way that guy preaches, but I like, I like small groups over here. I like that small group connection. I like, I like the fellowship that they have on there. I like the Sunday school class over here. And so you find people that, that are like shoppers. They're like consumers where, where they are satisfying themselves in different, different arenas of what the churches have to offer, but they never connect and embrace the responsibility. You would never find the house churches up uh, in the New Testament. You would never find individuals who, who go to this house church for this, ha this house church for this, this house church for this. It's completely foreign to the, to the model held forth in, in Scripture, which is what we should aspire to as the followers of Christ. But it becomes a way of, of avoiding obligation, responsibilities, embracing the, mess, the messiness and the brokenness of, of living with, with, with a people in, in community. I like the way New Testament scholar Eugene Peterson described it. Now, this is a New Testament scholar. He was asked one time, how did, uh, Dr. Peterson, how, how would you recommend someone choose a church to join. He said two things, pick one and stick with it. <laughs> pick one and stick with it. That means you go through all seasons of life with that, with that congregational community, the good and, and the bad. It's how you learn and you grow together. And when my son wanted to change roommates in, in college, I said, no, you're going to stick with it. That's how you learn and that's how you grow and how to deal with difficult personalities. Whenever you graduate, you go to the workplace, there's going to be challenging and difficult, difficult personalities that you have to work with on a, on a daily basis. And so this, this is your training ground, not just in the classroom, but even in that, that house. This is a part of your training. And like that, and... It's like that in, in a church, isn't it? Where all of us of different personalities, different backgrounds, we are thrown together into a congregational community relationship by virtue of our shared faith and commitment 
to Jesus Christ. Doesn't mean it's all smooth sailing, does it? But we have a like mind, an understanding of what we are about in our witness in, in the world. All of this rich diversity that is ours as a church family, it is to our growth and to our benefit as a community, as a people that are going out into our respective worlds. So I've never understood these individuals who never connect with, with a local church, a local body. And uh, I know what it is. It's, it's avoiding responsibility. It's the difference between being a renter and an owner. <laughs> but, it's, but you talk to some and it's like they've discovered and they think it's some spiritual high ground and they want to quote the word ecclesia to you. Uh, well, you know, Pastor, the ecclesia, you know, what's really important is that you're part of the church universal like, like, it, like they've discovered some spiritual high ground. It's either, uh, it's either the arrogance of some spiritual high ground or it's some deliberate disobedience. Because if you really want to get into the nuances of ecclesia in the New Testament, the word ecclesia, church, 75, 75% of the time in the New Testament in the Greek text, when you see the word ecclesia, it's in connection to a local community of believers. Rarely is it the church universal. It's the idea that God's people are always going to come together for, of a people of rich diversity and backgrounds. And the beauty of this is that they are bound together by faith in Jesus Christ, shared responsibility. And so that's why I think it is so important that in this communion observance, we are reminded that we are a people that are not living in Eden. We are living in a time and we are living a life that is less than idyllic, less than perfect. That we are all flawed, that we are all broken, that we are all in need of grace and mercy. And if we can't be sinless, we can at least be companions and we can participate at a table together. A table of grace, a table of mercy, a table of participation in shared community. As important as the creation account is in Genesis, I think of equal importance is the lesson of community that it is not good for man to be alone, that it's good to be together, that it is good to be a part of something shared. It is not good to be alone, ever. Years ago, a heat wave came through the Midwest in Chicago there were 939 heat-related deaths. Individuals were found in basements, attics, windowless apartments, many elderly, with underlying illnesses, to be sure. 83 were buried in a mass grave. No friends, no families, no neighbors, alone. At a time when Jesus never felt more alone in his life, knowing the path that he was about to take, I want you to notice what he said in Luke's gospel in chapter 22 and verse 15. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you. When he felt so alone, my desire, my earnest desire above all else, my desire is to eat this meal with you. 
That Passover meal that has been given many names, that has been in the history of the church, that has been transformed from a Passover meal to a meal of, of commemoration. If it says anything to us at all as the people of God, it's that you do not have to be alone. Let's pray together. Our Father, we are a sinful and a broken people. We are a part of what Adam and Eve have, have brought about into this world, a, a brokenness. Something that is a far cry from, from what you designed. But Father, we as a people being redeemed by you, being transformed day by day, prayerfully into the, whole, into the likeness of Christ. Father, how grateful we are that in our brokenness, we need not be alone. We need not isolate ourselves, but that you are a God that holds forth the metaphor of family, the metaphor of communion, togetherness, participation. And so, Father, how grateful we are that in our in our best times in life, in our worst times of life, how grateful we are to be a part of a community, to be a part of your fellowship, the body of Christ, to be a part of being your presence in our world, a world that desperately needs your presence and your proclamation. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. If you'll take your wafer. Jesus said, this is the bread which came down from heaven. Not as the fathers ate and died. He that eateth of this bread shall live forever. And on that night, having taken the cup, the Lord blessed it and said to his disciples, this is my blood which has been shed for you for the remission of sin. Take and drink. Let's stand together and rejoice in the truth. God loves us so much that he gave his one and only son that we might know life. For God so loved the world that he gave us, his one and only Son to save us. Whoever believes in him will live. The power of hell forever defeated. Now it is well. I'm walking in freedom for God. So loved, God so loved the world. Let's sing it out. Come, all you weary, come, all you thirsty, come to the well that never runs dry. Drink of the no more Come all you sinners Come find his mercy Come to the table He will satisfy Taste of his goodness And find what you're looking for Sing it out. For God so
some lay them down at the foot of the cross Jesus is waiting there with open arms He has open arms for God so